Well, let's go to our guests now. Joining me in Beirut is Jamal Hossein, a columnist at the Lebanese newspaper Al Akbar. In Dayton, Ohio, we have Randa Salim. She's the director of the Conflict Resolution Program at the Middle East Institute. And in Nottingham, England, is Afzal Ashraf. He's an expert on terrorism and global security at Nottingham University. Good to have you all on the program. Afzal Ashraf, is this worth Britain's trouble taking on Hezbollah, taking on Iran? Is it worth the trouble if it means getting closer to the United States? Well, it depends on what you mean by trouble. So far, Hezbollah hasn't troubled the UK, and it is unlikely to do so unless it um, wants to make itself much more vulnerable to retaliation from the US and other European countries. So what uh, the UK has done in this is to bring a certain degree of uh, consistency in its approach to Hezbollah by declaring the whole organization a terrorist organization and freezing its assets. And in so doing, it's also um, carried favor with the U.S. because that is what the U.S. would like for European and other countries to do. So it has got a great deal of political gain from it. Uh, it has got uh, some consistency in its policy. Mm -hmm and it's unlikely to suffer any significant consequences at this stage. Well, the EU, of which Britain is soon to not be a member of anymore, makes that distinction still between the political and the armed wings. Randa Salim, is Britain doing a more pragmatic thing here? Is it doing something that's less silly? The distinction is something that's almost impossible to do. Hezbollah itself does not distinguish between the political and military wing. Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General, is the Secretary General of the whole organization, including the political and military ways. And so, uh, so in that respect, uh, Britain is being consistent in terms of its approach to Hezbollah. If, it is, if one part of it is terrorist or designated as terrorist, the whole organization, you know, should be also designated as such, because the organization itself does not make that distinction. Uh, however, whether this, uh, I mean, will this be costly for Britain, uh, I think, of all the activities or all the resolution motions that Britain could take, uh, I think this is the least costly, especially mm. in terms, and, mm. and cost-benefit, if you get, you know, for it, if you do cost-benefit analysis, I right. think the benefit from participation for Britain is much higher. Right, and it's probably harder to fight Iranian proxies on the actual battlefield than it is to squeeze some of their finances. Jamal Hussein, Hezbollah is a large part of Lebanese society, a large part of the people who are actually running this new government or trying to run the new government. Is it actually going to hurt Hezbollah, given that Britain has upped the ante? Uh, well, I mean, we have to realize here, when they uh, talk about freezing financial assets, uh, we have to realize that Hezbollah has been off the global banking grid for decades now. Uh, mm -hmm. They've been threatened with sanctions and uh, sanctions and sanctioned uh, before, and uh, they've always been uh, uh, chased, basically, by the U.S. and the U.K. So they do not run their finances through uh, their banking system. They're, they don't have their money in a UK bank waiting for Boris Johnson to freeze them. So they've, they've moved away from that banking system for years. So it's not really going to affect them any, in any way financially, that's for sure. And uh, when it comes to running the country, I mean, um, it would hurt the UK basically more to uh, avoid talking to uh, the Lebanese government, uh, that, of, of which Hezbollah uh, is a member, mm -hmm. uh, because they have a vested interest in the country and they still want to uh, guard those. Right. Afzal Ashraf, I mean, Hezbollah doesn't just do things like hand out social grants and provide social services in places like Beirut. It is active on the battlefield in places like Syria, supporting Assad and so on. By doing this, um, is the UK saying it is firmer in its belief of strengthening the other side when it comes to the conflicts in the Middle East right now, the Saudis and, and their allies? Yes, I think um, it's not so much the Saudis, but uh, the fact that the, the, the U.S. is part of the other side, as you put it. I think that the U.K. has had a strategic policy for many decades now that it would always be the alliance of first choice in political and military matters with the U.S. And if the U.S. wants to take a particular line, uh, sometimes reluctantly, the U.K. will provide some support. Um, 
they have tried in the past to uh, shape U.S. policy and through back channels to have some degree of nuance. But in this current regime, there doesn't seem to be any scope for it. And I think uh, the U.K. is very careful about the battles it wants to fight mm. with the U.S. So it is, for example, in, in the last day or two, it has gone partly against U.S. advice in accepting a Chinese company uh, to, to uh, help with the infrastructure of the 5G network, the telephone network in the U.K. It is certainly not going to sacrifice any brownie points, as we put it, or uh, uh, any uh, credit with the U.S. Right. Uh, by going against Hezbollah in this case. Jamal Hassan, for those who believe that this might give the green light to put a target on Hassan Nasrallah himself, especially in the context of Qasim Soleimani being targeted recently, is that realistic? I mean, as far as uh, we know for now, the UK was not involved in that. But uh, <laughs> if we move uh, from in the assassination of Soleimani, but uh, we have to uh, keep in mind that Hassan Nasrallah has always been a target of assassination and he takes uh, extraordinary uh, precautions to avoid that. That was not the case with Qasem Soleimani. He, uh, the US took advantage of that. He was traveling openly in a civilian flight and uh, uh, that's how it happened. This is not the case uh, with uh, Hassan Nasrallah. So this is not... Uh, I mean, this is not, uh, we're comparing apples and oranges mm -hmm. here. Uh, but as, again, the UK, I, I don't think uh, they want to be associated with the assassination of Qasim Soleimani or with any uh, military action in Lebanon, because that would be uh, uh, something that uh, they haven't done so far. And uh, this would be something else. They would be really uh, jumping in, uh, in bed with the, the crazy rulers of Washington, which started something they don't know how to get right. out of. All things considered, Randa Salim, by further sanctioning and prescribing Hezbollah by a UN Security Council member doing this, is this going to be better for the region or worse? I think these sanctions have already been factored in to the security structure as well as the political calculus of all the actors in the region, be it uh, regional actors or extra-regional actors. However, I think what, what, what affects it is it eliminates communication channels. You know, even if Britain, even if the U.S. considers Hezbollah as their enemy and consider them as terrorists, you know, I think, at the, I mean, you need to talk with your enemy at some point. So it doesn't mean that sanctioning them should eliminate any kind of back channel uh, communications, if possible. Uh, now, whether this is going to push other EU countries to follow in Britain's footsteps, we know that last week there has been push by American officials in Brussels in meetings with parliamentarians, EU parliamentarians, to get a, a, an EU ban uh, issued by the EU parliament. I think there will be many challenges to that because there are some countries like France that have some, and Italy, that have some of their officers, you know, part of the UNIL uh, right. presence in southern Lebanon that want to maintain these links and these communication channels with Hezbollah right. and find any kind of this kind of total ban, mm -hmm. unnecessary provocative action. Yeah, it's probably easier for the German parliament to do it than it is for the French and the Italians, as you, you mentioned, Randa. With that in mind, Afzal, is it possible, do you think it's likely that the EU as a whole will make that call and take that extra step that the Americans want them to? At this stage, uh, I think um, I, I wouldn't want to uh, make a prediction either way. I think, as you've described, there are tensions uh, within the EU Parliament, and we may uh, have to see how pressure is put on uh, countries like France by the US uh, to, to bring them in line, as it were. But I, I think the most important thing to remember is that this particular issue in the EU, uh, EU Parliament actually points to a potential um, uh, harm or restriction that uh, Hezbollah might face. Because if uh, the EU countries stop uh, uh, or doing business 
with, uh, with, with Hezbollah in terms of just normal goods, or if they're restricted from providing aid to Lebanon, which might indirectly go in to benefit Hezbollah. All of this will put direct pressure on Hezbollah, perhaps not to the extent that it will uh, restrict it to any significant degree, but certainly to a degree that it will feel the pain, as it were. I think more importantly than that, um, whilst it is quite right that uh, Nasrullah has been a target, and this is not going to make the chances of assassinating Nasrullah or other Hezbollah leadership that much easier. What it will do, and this is the important thing, in the West, there has to be some sort of uh, ethical, legal argument for this. At the moment, uh, it's very weak. Right. And I think this adds um, this uh, adds to that argument, that justification argument for any future action. And I think that is one of the primary drivers behind this move. Okay. Afzal, Randa and Jamal, good to talk to all of you. Looking forward to having you back on the program sometime soon. Thanks for joining us.